Well, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Um, you know, Wednesdays have been a blessing and a curse lately. I know we're we're getting so much moisture, which is fabulous, but it's been very hard to get together. So um, we appreciate all of you being here um, for braving the weather, the cold, and the snow. And man, is it cold out there! So thank you so much for coming. Um, I'd like to shout out a very special thanks to Christy and Tiffany with REMAX Alliance um, for their community support of tonight's town hall meeting. And I'd also like to thank My Mountain Town, um, Sharon Trilk in the back, and for videotaping tonight's meeting, and Connor for Jazzercise for providing water for tonight. So a link will be available tomorrow um, for you to view the meeting tonight. And um, you can see it for the second time, but then it will go out to a lot of people, and hopefully everybody will be watching it also um, tomorrow sometime. I think one time we even had um, 650 people view the town hall meeting, so hopefully we get that many viewing it tomorrow. That would be great. So our speakers tonight have been asked to present just the facts, not to support, not in support or in opposition to any development, ballot issue, or anything else. Um, and most of you have been here, so you know that we have all the presenters talk for the first hour from 7 to 8. And then at that point, we'll go to an open house format, and you can go and talk to all of the presenters um, about you know any questions and everything that you may have. So what is going on around here? Um, first of all, we have some news about the Conifer Library, and the Public Services Manager, Jessica Paulson, is here to talk a little bit about that. Jessica. Thanks, Shirley. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out on the snowy evening. Um, I just wanted to start out tonight by addressing some of the questions that many of you have around Conifer Library. Um, you may have heard that JCPL did identify library services for Conifer as a capital project, which means we budgeted two and a half million dollars this year to evaluate our current and implement recommended services for the Conifer area. Um, so currently, our leadership is conducting stakeholder interviews with targeted members of the community, and some of you have been contacted. Um, our next steps will be to gather full community input, and that means surveys and meetings, both, both virtual and in person, I think. Um, and so we'll be holding those in the coming months. Um, we want to hear from as many people as possible, and we do intend to hear from the entire community before making any decisions. Um, so please keep an eye on our website or other communication channels for information about when those meetings will be held. Um, and then I also want to share that we do value our relationship with the school, and we enjoy being in the school. So after gathering all of that community input, we'll work close, closely with the high school um, to provide library services and find the best solutions to do that. Um, so some other things happening at Conifer Library are some of the programs. It's tax season, so we have those forms available for you, um, and we're happy to print any other forms or instructions on demand if you need any. Uh, we have family story times every Saturday at 9.15 a.m., so come bring the family and start your weekend out in a fun way. And then we've got a Teen Dungeons and Dragons that happens monthly. The next one is March 16th. And then finally, we have one of our signature events at JCPL. It's an author talk at the Arvada Center for the Arts. This year, we're going to fe feature Kate Quinn. Um, she's a historical fiction writer, and there are only a few seats left. The event is on March 18th, and you can register online. Right? I'll be here after the session if anyone wants to chat, and hope to see you at the library. Thank you, Jessica. Um, next, we actually have a presentation, a very short presentation, about CDOT um, and the Kings Valley Project. Um, CDOT was unable to come last year, or last week, and then this week because of you know, Wednesday nights. Um, and then also Peggy Catlin, who is our director for RTD, um, was not able to make it tonight. Um, but Susie Nelson, who is one of our uh, board members for CAC, is going to do a little presentation on both of those. Thank you, Shirley. Okay, CDOT sent this little report. CDOT kicked off the design of the Kings Valley Project in January of 2023. 
They are actively working towards a 30% design milestone, uh, which is expected to take place this summer, 2023. At this 30% design milestone, they'll have a better understanding of needed funding and other project details. And they understand that this is an important project for the community and look forward to sharing these updates with you at a future CAC meeting. Please continue to check the Kings Valley Project website. I don't know if you're going to write this down, but it's www.cdot.gov slash projects slash studies slash US 285 dash Kings Valley for project information. And this is RTD's report, which is a little longer. Okay, they're, they're looking at ride price and equity analysis right now at RTD with the intent of simplifying its fare structure and adjusting fares to be more equitable across all user groups. The board of directors will be considering a proposal in the next few months that would both simplify and reduce fares across the region. What this could mean for the mountain communities is that there would no longer be a regional fare for such routes as the CV and EV bus routes. The regional fare would be folded into the local fare. Fare for airport routes would be lowered slightly. Tonight's RTD Operations and Safety Committee has several items on its agenda and, it approved, and if approved, will be forwarded to the full Board of Directors on February 28th. Details of these proposals can be found on RTD's website at RTD dash denver.com. We are also broadcasting the meetings on YouTube. RTD makes service changes three times a year with the next proposed changes scheduled for May. Despite extraordinary recruitment efforts, RTD's current employment levels limit its ability to increase service. Changes that riders of the light rail might want to be aware of are minor schedule adjustments to the D-line from Midhall. Also under consideration this evening is a revised code of conduct and service policy revisions. A steering committee comprised of law enforcement, criminal justice, public health, and social services entities was formed to focus on mitigating the impacts of unwelcomed behaviors on RTD facilities, particularly at Denver Union Station and in the urban, urban core such as sales and use of illicit drugs and aggressive behaviors. In the spirit of firm compassion, the overall goal is to restore a welcoming transit environment. Many of you and other constituents have expressed concerns about feeling safe when using RTD facilities, and this code is meant to address that and restore ridership. However, there have been concerns raised that the code would unfairly target those experiencing homelessness. A comprehensive peer review from comparable transit agencies across the country was conducted to assess RTD's transit security model. Recommendations from this review are being implemented currently under the director of Chief Joel Fitzgerald, who was appointed in August as the Chief of Police and Emergency Management. These include augmenting the internal RTD police force, replacing contracted security, this is proposed to be implemented in phases with the goal of increasing officers from 22 to 70 in 2023 and additional augmentation in subsequent years. Also planned are infrastructure improvements to key transit hubs and stations, including additional surveillance cameras. RTD is strengthening and clarifying its partnership with Denver Police and other first responders in order to be more responsive. The focus of RTD's Police and Emergency Management Division is on evidence-based, intelligence-led policing. Based on these efforts, RTD has seen a decrease in the total number of criminal incidents in the past few months. Again, details of all of these facts I just read can be found on RTD's website. Thank you, Susie. Okay, next we have Director Ron Kilgore. He is here with um, Core Electric Co Cooperative, easy for me to say, and he's going to be talking about a few of the changes that are being made 
Um, they're, they're doing some amazing stuff, so he's going to be talking about a little bit of that. Ron. Thank you, Shirley. Welcome on a cold, cold night. Um, it's great to have a nice crowd here. I was expecting to be talking to an empty room um, because uh, it, was, it was pretty cold when I got in the car tonight. So I am your director for Area District 2 in, uh, in Core Electric Cooperative, formerly known as IREA, Intermountain Rural Electrification Association. Um, so District 2 is up as far as we go in Bergen Park, Evergreen, down through Conifer, through Deckers, around to Sedalia, actually. So it covers mostly mountain community. We have a little bit of Castle Rock, which is not quite mountainous, uh, but we've got some a, a lot of uh, new exciting things that are going on in, at, at CORE. So one of the things that's new and really exciting is uh, our power supply. Now you probably never really think about when you turn the light switch on, where does that electricity come from? Well that's something we as directors at CORE think a lot about, because we have to, you know, it's our goal to Make sure that every time you hit that switch, you have lights. So right now we have really four main uh, sources of our power. Uh, Comanche 3, which has been in the news a lot lately. It's a coal-fired plant, plant down in um, Pueblo, right outside of Pueblo. CORE actually owns 25% of that plant. Uh, there's litigation surrounding that. I can talk a lot more about that if you'd like to hear about it. It's uh, pretty boring, but I'm happy to chat with you about it. Um, so Comanche 3 covers, when it's working, which that's a lot of the problems, it doesn't work that often, but when it is working, it basically covers our base load, which means, you know, if you look at the load during the day between about 4 and 8, everybody comes on and, and washes clothes, dries clothes, cooks their dinner, and the, uh, our load goes way up. Um, but when, when it hits the bottom, which is about 10 o'clock to about 6 in the morning, that's what Comanche 3 provides, is all that power, the base load. And then the peaks that get covered by um, Xcel Energy, right now we're under contract to, that we have to buy everything we need from Xcel that we don't get from hydro, the other two sources, solar or hydroelectric. So uh, right now we're very um, tied in with uh, Xcel. However, there's something coming. There's a train headed toward us. About two years ago, we gave Excel a five-year notice that we're not going to play that game anymore. We're going to uh, cancel our, our agreement where we're buying all of our power from them, mostly because they're expensive and they're not very reliable. So uh, we are canceling that effective January 1st, 2026. So, um, it's been our job to figure out where we're going to get power starting January 1st, 2026. We are, um, there's another, another big mandate that is a 2030 date. So, we, the, all the power uh, companies in the state of Colorado have been mandated to come up with a plan from the Colorado State Legislature to reduce the carbon emissions by 80%, which is a, a tremendous amount. So we have we have a plan to do that, and we've figured out how to do that. The other thing is the future of Comanche 3 is uncertain. I mentioned the reliability problems. Uh, it is because 75% of the plant is owned by XL. Uh, it is governed by the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, CORE is not regulated by the Public Utilities Commission, but Comanche 3 is because it's owned primarily, the majority of it is owned by Excel. So, um, Excel has, uh, has basically agreed or, or proposed to the Public Service Commission that it goes out of service much sooner than its, uh, its rated lifespan. And even sooner than that, they would like to run it very intermittently. So, that's a uh, we're not really sure that that's going to work because you know we're 25 percent owners, so that is a subject of litigation uh, that we're working on. So this freight train is coming around the tracks; it's headed toward us. Where are we going to get our power? Well, we've kept, we've come up with a solution for that, and we have partnered with a company called Invenergy. Invenergy is a privately held company. Uh, it is 
out of Chicago, and they have about 200 power projects throughout the world. Those 200, some of them are in Colorado, and we have uh, contracted with them to provide about 400 megawatts of solar and wind power, about 100 megawatts of battery storage, which is new for us, because right now we don't have any battery storage on our system, and about 300 megawatts of existing uh, natural gas. It's called a peaking plant, basically. So that's something you can turn on quickly, that we can use it from four to eight and then turn it off, and it's exactly designed for that. So as you know, uh, both solar and wind are not continuous sources of power. Uh, so when they're working, when the, when the sun's shining, we charge the batteries. When the wind's blowing, we charge the batteries. And then we can store that, and it's, it's basically just like it's a, a gymnasium-sized room full of batteries like what's in your laptop. Um, and then those batteries can discharge and provide power for, for our uh, homes during the peak hours from 4 to 8 p.m. usually. Another big plus for this plan is it gives us freedom to get any uh, get power from any supplier that we want to. We're only contracted to, to take the power that we're contracted. So it's not, the, the term is an all requirements contract. We are not, we don't have to buy any more power from Invenergy. We can, if we find cheaper power, we can get it. Um, the really beautiful part of this is it meets all of our, our mandated goals and it's not any more expensive. So we're really thrilled that this is gonna work for us. Uh, so uh, this, is a, this is a great uh, deal for Core Electric Co-op. This is a 20 year deal. So our power supply is, is set and we're doing fine for 20 years. There's another thing that's coming down the pipe that is, um, it hasn't actually been publicized yet. Just last week we voted to hire an architect and a general contractor for a new Confer office. Right now the office is, in, is down by Elk Creek Elementary. It's a very dated facility. It's not meeting our needs anymore. So the new office is going to be in Pine Junction. It's going to be a, a nice new facility right beside a, a brand new substation. We're going to have room there. We can put battery storage there. So we're really excited about that. That's coming down the pipe. And I, this is probably the first public announcement for that. So it's actually way too early, that, and we don't even have uh, architectural drawings yet. Uh, I'd love to be able to put something really cool, uh, pictures of the, new, of the new renderings, but we don't have those yet because we just hired the architect. So thank you for having us and, bra and braving the cold weather, and I will turn it back over to Shirley. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Okay, so... Um, Lots of exciting things going on at CORE, and um, the, the elections are coming up, actually. Um, you need to vote, if you if you would like to, um, vote online at CORE Elect Electric Cooperative, um, and up until April 21st. So just wanted to let that, get that out there. Um, next, we have, obviously, as you all know, a new sheriff. And with a new sheriff come a lot of changes. And so our Mountain Precinct Commander, Scott Posick, is here. And he's going to talk just a little bit about some of the changes that are happening at the Sheriff's Department. Scott. As, as uh, it would have, have it uh, coming down with a little bit of a cold, and so I've got a little bit of a, a hoarse throat, but I'll get through this. Um, my name is Scott Posick. Um, I've been with the Sheriff's Office about 37 years, or going on 37 years, and I'm currently assigned to our Mountain Precinct as the commander. So I've been pretty much in, in all the areas of the Sheriff's Office, but currently, with the changes that we saw at the first of the year, um, I'm assigned to the Mountain Precinct. Um, a few other changes that we're, that we're doing, the Sheriff, uh, certainly Sheriff Marinelli, is, is setting up her executive staff as well, or, as well as the command staff structure so more to come on that. Um, that's still in that development process, but more to come on that. One of the things that was very important to Sheriff Marinelli when she was campaigning, and, and certainly is important, is, um, is setting up a wellness program at the Sheriff's Office. You know, we've always been good about taking care of our employees, but we can always do better in taking care of our employees. No secret, law enforcement is, uh, is very difficult, stressful, 
um, career field to get into, both for the sworn and our professional staff. And so that is something that's um, that's a priority for her. And and so that program is moving ahead, and we'll be we'll be presenting on that and talking on that um, more in the future. But I would venture to say by midsummer we'll have the wellness program established. And what that will look like is not only physical wellness, but mental health wellness uh, as well. So again, taking care of our employees that, that see a lot of um, a lot of tragic events in their, in their careers. One of those tragic events that I'd like to talk about just briefly is something that happened just last week, and I'm sure you, you heard about it in the news, and that's when we lost one of our canine partners um, in a line of duty death. That's the first time that we've lost a canine in, in the line of duty since the inception of the canine unit, which is started in about 1978. I actually was on the canine unit for about 10 years. Um, the dogs are extremely valuable to us. So it was something difficult that we're going through right now. We will have a, uh, a tribute memorial ceremony next week. Uh, it'll be, it'll be uh, just a law enforcement uh, event. Um, but, but that's, again, something that, uh, to take care of our employees. So working on that. I do want to touch briefly on, on crime trends that we're seeing in the Mountain Precinct. So I looked at the crime stats for this past month. Um, you should be very happy that you live in a, in a, in a very low crime area, for sure. Um, Conifer, particularly, when I looked at Conifer versus the North Party and Evergreen, Conifer is definitely lower than, than Evergreen, but in general, the entire Mountain Precinct has a pretty low crime rate. What I do want to talk about is a couple of things. One is uh, just steps of not making yourself a victim. Um, so one of the things that we do see is trespass to, to vehicles, so going into a car and stealing something of value in the car. So what we always tell the community is one, lock the car, and two, don't leave valuables in the car, particularly in plain view in the car. And that's what we see um, quite often, you know, going to run into the store for just a second and not lock the car. And it only takes a second for something of value to be stolen. So that's something that we see. Another, another thing that we're seeing um, more and more often, probably no secret to any of you, is road rage type incidents, particularly on, along the 285 corridor. And, and what I would say in that regard is ensuring that um, you avoid road rage. So, you know, years ago, you have a beef with somebody on the road and it may be, may be flipping the bird back and forth and that was about it. But today, they're pulling guns. People are pulling guns. And it's just not worth it. And that's something that, that, that we are very mindful of. You probably have seen quite a bit of um, uh, activity, law enforcement activity, along the 285 corridor. Road rage is one reason why we really pay a lot of particular uh, attention along the 285 corridor. Um, the other thing that we see that we're seeing in the mountain precinct, particularly, is uh, mail theft. One reason why is there there are a lot of cluster mailboxes. Knowing and, and you know the, the the those committing the crimes know that people are generally gone, right, at work or what have you, um, for the most of the day, and so it's it's at target, it's at that being victims. Um, one thing I like to say with mailbox thefts is um, to ensure that it's being reported. Oftentimes what we find is there were a series of mailbox thefts and none of them were reported. It, what we need, we need those to be reported. Not necessarily that we're gonna be able to find who did it, but it also, it, it helps us in, in identifying other types of crime like, um, like uh, credit card frauds and that sort of thing, which is what that leads to. So, um, so making sure that those types of crimes are reported. Um, and then real quickly, it was mentioned earlier about RTD and the cooperation with RTD. Uh, we, work, we work with RTD police, specifically in the RTD park and rides. There's a couple of them along the 285 corridor and one in Evergreen. And what we're, we're coordinating with them, working with RTD police to help us, and oftentimes cars get abandoned and then those cars are left abandoned, they're broken into, parts are stolen off of them, and they, they, uh, 
they developed what we call the broken windows theory. So you have a car that's been left abandoned, and then it, it, it actually attracts other types of crime. So we're working with RTD police to get those, those uh, vehicles, those abandoned vehicles, towed out of those lots so that it's not, they're not uh, that, that broken windows theory. Um, so a couple of things that we're working on with RTD as well. I see that my time's up. I actually didn't think I was going to go to the end of my time, but I will be back here after the meeting and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, okay, well next we have a presentation by um, Planning and Zoning. Heather Guthrie, who is usually here, put that together for us. She was going to be here last week, but she is in a planning commission here in tonight, so she couldn't be here tonight. Um, but did, she did send the PowerPoint presentation, and Marilyn Salzman, one of our board members, is going to give that to us. Marilyn. So I'm going to ask for forgiveness in advance. I know nothing about this. I'm going to be reading, and I'm trying to hold a microphone, a slide advancer, and the notes. So please forgive my clumsiness in advance. So this is an update on planning and zoning since the last meeting. Uh, case manager information is on each slide so that questions can go directly to them. Oops. So the planning and regulation update. Uh, last time Heather talked about the county plan and regulation update that will be coming soon. This project includes updating the county's comprehensive master plan, transportation master plan, all hazards evacuation annex, and unified land use code. All plans are going to be brought together through a unified public engagement plan, and policies will be integrated throughout the plans. And the Board of County Commissioners are going to be briefed on this in the next two weeks, and after that we'll know more about the timing and the process. To make sure that you're notified of any proposed planning and zoning regulation, or plan updates, please sign up for Notify Me and choose Planning and Zoning Plan Updates and Planning and Zoning Regulation Updates. Through this listserv, you can get notifications via email, text, or both. So first we're going to talk about... Wait a minute. Okay, so development proposals in our area. As of February, 20, February 1st, there are 27 cases at some stage of the development process on the 285 corridor. Since September, there have been one new pre-application, two new community meetings, one new special use, and one rezoning update. And we'll go through those on the following slides. The numbers on the slides correspond with the number in the land use cases report to the Conifer 285 corridor. The special use is not on the land use cases list, but will be discussed on the slideshow. So pre-application. Pre-application process is very preliminary request for information from county staff about a potential project. The applicant submits some basic information and receives comments from the staff about the big issues that may come up during the processes that would be needed to complete the project. Staff referred, including planning and zoning, transportation, public health, and other agencies that may be applicable. About 40 to 50 percent of these cases do not move forward. Since they are so preliminary, there is not public notice of these cases that, occur, that occurs if a formal application is received or if a community meeting is scheduled. Okay, so the first case. Pre okay. I'll keep, keep talking. Pre application number seven. That's at 10537 South Deer Creek Road. A special use to add buildings. And this is a 40 acre property off South Deer Creek Road. Uh, the proposal is for a special use to add buildings to an existing religious retreat center. A community meeting was held on January 5th. Um, unfortunately, the case manager for this case has left the county, so if it keeps um, going forward, it will be assigned to somebody new. 
Pre-application number nine. This is a new pre-application. It's on the south side of 285 near Kings Valley. The proposal is for a rezoning to allow community uses, events, and lodging on 241 acres. There are four different plan recommendations ranging from um, dwelling units, one dwelling unit for five acres, to non-residential uses. So again, this is a pre-application, so they really haven't decided what they're going to do with the land yet. Okay, the next one is rezoning and special use. A rezoning is when someone wants to change the allowed uses on the property. There are four points throughout the process where there is public notification. At the time of a community meeting, formal application, and at two public hearings. Testimonies can be given at either the Planning Commission or at the Board of County Commissioners, and the Commissioners make the final decision. So, and there's a timeline there of how long that takes. Community meeting number 25, 10197 Crestview Drive. And this is in the Hilldale Pines area. The applicant wants to rezone the property from MR2 to MR1 with the ultimate goal of obtaining a short-term rental permit. This is on 2.15 acres, and the plan recommends an area of stability. The community meeting was on November 29th of last year, and a case manager will be assigned if there's a formal request. Most of you probably know about this next one, special use. Shadow Mountain Bike Path Park, special use for the day used lift serve bike park. It is not on the land use cases list because it was an incomplete application and therefore not, not, of all, the, not all the information has been provided. So they're still working on that one. Rezoning number 11. This is the Conifer Center. This is the one behind the Safeway Center for 188 residential units. There has been no status change on this, but it is a case, as you know, of high interest. The applicant is still trying to reserve outstanding issues. Rezoning number 14. The last rezoning case that had a change is the case off of Chamberlain Road near Tiny Town. It is a rezoning up to MR2 along with a lot line adjustment to allow a house addition. The plan recommends this as an area of stability. Since our last meeting, this case went from first referral to second referral, so it's moving through the process. And that is, I think, the end of the report tonight. Thank you for my... Um, for listening to my clumsy report. <laughs> Marilyn, you did an amazing job with what you had to work with there. There were a lot of, a lot of things. Um, we did not provide the development report for you tonight. Usually we do. Um, however, it is always on the coniferarea.org website. So all of the development updates are on there, and you can certainly go there, and you can find out all the information um, it has all of the information as far as you need to talk to um, and where it stands in the process. So just go to our website, and that'd be great. Okay, so next, um, I would like to introduce our, our new, newly elected state senator, um, Mark Baisley. He's going to be talking about the legislature and a little bit of an update. <laughs> Thank you, Shirley. Uh, good evening, everyone. And it's, uh, it's an honor to represent South Jefferson County in the Colorado State Senate. Uh, I served for the previous four years in the State House, and I kind of did a dose I go with uh, Tammy Story. She moved to the House, and I moved to the Senate. Um, so this State Senate District 4 uh, for Jefferson County is everything south of 285, but west of C-470. So, it includes uh, King Carroll Valley, that's the, the, the greatest concentration of uh, folk, and then just all points south of uh, 285, plus uh, seven other counties. So it goes <coughs> Park, Lake, Chafee, uh, the rural parts of Douglas, 
and Teller, Fremont, and Custer. So I like to say it goes from Franktown to Leadville, and from just south of the uh, Red Rocks Amphitheater down to Westcliff, if you know where that is, uh, south of uh, the Royal Bridge Bridge. So it's a pretty good chunk of land, and it's gorgeous. So I get a lot of uh, wind chill time uh, traveling between uh, uh, towns. So I thought it would be interesting maybe to uh, share status on three bills that uh, we're working on. So we have, uh, in, according to our constitution, state constitution, 120 days that we meet each year in the, uh, in the session. So we began January 8th. We will, we will wrap up, oops, January 9th. We'll wrap up, I believe it's May 8th uh, this year. So uh, not a whole lot of time. It's uh, you know, a third of the year. The uh, three bills that I'll tell you about, one has to do with, uh, with taxation relief. So on even numbered years in June, that is when um, our property valuations are pegged, and that's for the entire state. So as it happened this time, uh, property valuations were at their peak uh, in June of 2022, which means that um, the, the assessed value of our homes is going to go up higher than it has it's ever been. It's going to be a bit of a shock to folks. So county commissioners across the state have been asking, hey, can we constitutionally um, put a temporary hold on some mill levies because we're going to be bringing in so much more revenue than we actually need. So to, to uh, allay some of that shock to the citizens, can we put some on hold. The real concern is not can they uh, have a vacation from a mill levy, but can they turn that mill levy back on in a, a two years from now or so? Because they're wondering, do we have to go through uh, another election because of Tabor uh, requiring permission, uh, the Taxpayers Bill of Rights requiring permission to raise taxes. So anyway, so this one bill would make that, uh, settle that score um, and uh, hopefully allow for uh, comfort, really, for county commissioners to uh, put vacation for some mill levies. So try to uh, soften that blow for us all uh, later this year. Um, another bill that I'll tell you about, because I just find it of general interest. It's up for a uh, vote in committee tomorrow, and I don't know how I'm going to vote on it yet. Uh, but it's of general interest. So how many uh, Taylor Swifters are there in the house? <laughs> Two admitting it. I didn't think. <laughs> Um, I don't even know what song she sings, I'm sorry. <laughs> but this, the Taylor Swift tour, world tour uh, debacle with uh, getting tickets is what prompted a bill that, uh, that I may even co-sponsor. There are parts that I'm really nervous about, so we've got we to gotta fix some pieces to it. But the idea is to prevent um, the bots from from jump, jumping out there when you're buying tickets to an event, sporting event, concert, and so on. There's software, of course, that just goes out there and just snags as many as possible and with a lot of money behind that, and then resells it at a much higher price. Um, there's a whole lot of shenanigans that happen. We're trying to prevent to that. So, uh, boy, all these companies are just campaigning to us, lobbying us like crazy, because they're all jockeying for their position, Ticketmaster and, and uh, Oh, I've forgotten the names of all of them. But anyway, they've all been in my office today <laughs> and saying, you, you got to vote against us. you got to vote for it. Make this adjustment, and we'll be comfortable with it, and so on. Anyway, I, I really think that we need to address that. I think it's an appropriate role of government to, uh, to help folks. In fact, I had, had uh, lunch with the president of uh, CU today, and he said, hey, we'd like to see um, our fans as... Uh, the only ones who buy a ticket at base value to come watch our, our sports events. So anyway, I think that's going to be of great interest, so keep an eye on that. It's uh, Senate Bill 60 if you're interested. Um, the first bill I mentioned is uh, Senate Bill 108, uh, the tax taxation uh, relief bill. And then the last one I'll mention is uh, uh, Senate Bill 103 that I am carrying, and um, it was brought to me by a Park County Commissioner. So what it, what it is, very briefly, is limiting the liability of property owners who allow access across their land to access 
to get to like the 14ers, uh, to fly fishing spots, to campgrounds. So as it turns out, there are property owners that own tens of thousands of acres of property in Colorado, and believe it or not, some of the 14ers are owned privately. I didn't know that until just a couple months ago. But um, they were, they're fine with, these people are very gracious for decades that they've been allowing hikers to come across their property to go hike a 14er, get to that fly fishing spot, but they just don't want to get sued if you break your leg along the way. Understandable. So there has been uh, law in place, as I've researched, going back as far as 1969, that has limited the liability of those property owners for allowing free access across their property. It all kind of, kind of came crashing down last year when someone successfully sued a property owner uh, who, when he got hurt um, on property that he was, uh, he was accessing. And so we're trying to limit that liability further and allow for uh, all that recreation that makes Colorado, Colorado. So anyway, thanks for hearing me out. It's uh, an honor to represent you in the state senate. And thanks for coming out on this cold night. <laughs> okay, we might have it back, hopefully. <laughs> um, boy, I, I had no idea how large your district was. My goodness, <laughs> that's amazing. So, but welcome. Thank you for coming. So, um, next, I'm sure that you all have um, read about, surveyed everything um, about the consolidation of the fire districts. And three of our fire chiefs tonight are here to talk just about that and the survey results um, that came from you doing those surveys. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Kurt Rogers. I'm the chief with North Fork Fire Protection District. Uh, really appreciate all you coming out tonight on this cold, snowy night. Um, we have a little slide deck that we'd like to present tonight. Um, the other chiefs, chief. Uh, Skip Sherlock with Inner Canyon and Jacob Blair with Elk Creek Fire. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Skip to start off here, and um, we'll be around after the presentation for questions as well tonight. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate that. Good evening. I uh, appreciate you guys coming out. It's a little chilly outside, so uh, thank you for making the trip up here. So we're going to talk to you guys for a little bit about consolidation. And the three chiefs have been looking at our individual districts for quite a long time to see where we're at, where we're going, and some changes we might need to make. And we really think about not next year, but five years, 10 years, 20 years, where are we going to be? And so that's what started us down this road to begin considering consolidation. So what are some of the challenges that we currently face? Well, we know that population growth is increasing here. Um, it looks like we might be seeing a 20% growth in population by the year 2030. And additionally, our population is aging. Typically, 65 and older are three times more likely to call us for our services. At the same time, we're seeing a continual decrease in volunteers. National average, which we trend and we follow, are actually a little higher, is a 17% reduction. It's becoming harder and harder to find volunteers. So while calls are going up, the extent of the call is going up, our volunteers at the same time are decreasing. We also know one of our biggest threats here is wildfire. I think we can all agree that that is probably one of our biggest concerns that we have. And the reality is that none of the districts up here can handle a large incident by ourselves. We're continually calling each other for mutual aid to come help out structure fires, wildland fires, large, like multiple agency events where we have several cars that have gone off the road, or it could even be our third or fourth call happening at once. We need to rely on each other. Additionally, all of our equipment is going up in cost, just like everything else. A few years ago, a typical engine that we have would be 500,000, 600,000. That same engine today is well over a million dollars. So we're seeing quite an increase in costs. 
We are fixed with our incomes. We rely heavily, 98, 90% of our income comes from property tax. And quite frankly, we don't have enough to keep up with the demand that we are seeing today. So as we said, we're often calling for each other. Just today, Inner Canyon had a call for a structure fire. And immediately, we had to call Elk Creek for mutual aid. We simply do not have the resources that we need. Our busiest time is during the day, it's during the week. And we don't have the ability to cover those on our own. You can ask me the last week, each one of our districts has had to call on each other for anything from a hike out to a medical call to a structure fire. So what do we do? What are our plans? Well, we can just keep doing what we're doing, status quo, which means that we are all dispatched by the same center, but we're dispatched at different times. Meaning if we get a call like today, I had to ask this batch to send out Creek. Well, there's 30 seconds or a minute. And then the dispatcher has to get that going, there's another 30 seconds. Well, that adds up over time. We're dispatched separately right now. We're all competing for volunteers. Our biggest, our most important commodity, and we're all struggling for those few volunteers out there. Um, we, like we said, we have a fragmented communication system, which means our response times lag. When we look at consolidation, one of the biggest things we can do is we can be dispatched at the same time. And the response times are going to come down. When a call comes in, the whole entire area is going to be dispatched at once, which means resources are moving immediately, immediately to that call. Um, it also uh, gives us the ability to share this burden amongst ourselves, so we're able to pool our resources to make ideally a much better organization. So how did we get here? So in 2021, we there were four districts at the time. We engaged in a third party feasibility study to look at does consolidation even make sense. And over 18 months, what they did was they looked at our, our budgets, they looked at our equipment, they looked at our, our rosters, they looked at our standing operating procedures, everything. And after 18 months, what they concluded is they felt that consolidation is what makes sense for our districts. And they suggested that we do that within two years. What are the practicalities? What does this look like if we consolidate? Well, quite frankly, it looks like it does now. It's a different name, but the same people, the same stations, the same equipment. But we are doing this together, which means that we can pool our resources, which means we can engage to create a much more uh, robust management structure. We can bring in increased staffing, and we can work and share the knowledge and the talent that we have across across the 400 square miles that that would be. I'm going to turn it over to the Chief Ware now. All right, perfect. Hey everybody, I'm Jacob Ware. I'm the uh, Fire Chief for Mill Creek Fire Protection District. <clears throat> so the benefits. Currently, we, Elk Creek, has one station staffed with four professional firefighters on 24-7, as well as our staff of volunteers. Our goal is to bring on, if, if we're able to consolidate, is to bring on three staff stations across the new district. That will be one down in Pine, Elk Creek, and then down, uh, would that be Morrison? Just below Windy Point. Just below Windy Point, just Morrison. It, it's technically Morrison, so it's just below Windy Point. The idea is, though, that's what the uh, the consolidation study, the feasibility study, that pointed out, that that's where our call volumes were, and that would be the quickest travel times to get to all of the areas within the district. So the goal is to have three staff stations with professional firefighters on 24-7. Also, facility upgrades. If you've ever been to our stations, our station one was built in 1962. Um, it has had remodel upon remodel upon several remodels. Uh, last one we did is 2015, which was probably the best model remodel. We actually had all the asbestos taken out of it, which was good, um, and several other things. But it's still a very dated building. We're, we're completely built out of it. We can't support any more paid firefighters there unless we start doubling up in bunk rooms. The living quarters are too small. And frankly, the building is too small for the size of apparatus today. Station 2 is one of the buildings that we're talking about redoing. Uh, our Station 2 is one of the Pine Junction. Um, it's down just past Moore on the right-hand side if you're heading towards Hidden Valley. It's basically a two-bay steel building. Right now, we have 14 firefighters working out of it, uh, which is probably more than it can handle. Uh, we actually have a uh, port-a-john outside because the facilities are not enough 
to handle that. That's where our wildland station works. But that one is the one we're going to completely remodel. Down at uh, <clears throat> uh, North Fork, Energy, or North Fork Station 1, all the way down to Pine, that's the other one. That will be another staff station. That one's a newer station. That's just going to take some facility improvements in there to turn that into living quarters. And the last one is Inner Canyon Station 3, the one I talked about just below Windy Point. That one's going to be a complete remodel. That one will be re raised and a new building will be put up there. The other thing we can do is retain. We, we, we'll stop fighting for volunteers. The running joke is amongst all of us, keeping on my time, paying attention. Um, we always compete with volunteers, and it's a running joke. Whenever we get a good volunteer, we always ask, well, what's your address? Whose district are you in? Because then we all figure out who they belong to. Ah, you know, and if it's not me, then you'll. But we're always competing for volunteers. As one district, we'll no longer be able to do that. We'll be able to leverage all the volunteers that we have in one district. It will also provide a lot more training opportunities for the volunteers that we have. And last but not least is replacing apparatus. Apparatus, NFPA, kind of our governing body, they recommend frontline engines should be removed from frontline service at the end at 15 years. Our newest engine's a 2014, our oldest is a 1998, and that's pretty much the same story all across the district. We all have aging apparatus. And they've become a lot more expensive. Five hundred thousand dollar engine five years ago is now pushing a million dollars. So what's the process look like? We've been working on this. We've been living it for years now. Community outreach. This has all been driven by the taxpayers. The first thing we wanted to do was go out and see if it was even possible. That's where we got the feasibility study a year and a half ago or so. That said, it is possible and it's a good idea and you will be able to provide a better service for the people. Due diligence, right now we're, re we're researching, we're working on budgets, we're working on staffing models, we're working on what that's gonna look like. There's gonna be a tremendous amount of information coming out over the next couple months with what this, con the, excuse me, this proposed consolidation could look like. Then the board's gonna approve it. All three boards have to vote to do this. You know, there, there have been some people saying, well, this is already a done deal, it's already put together. Not at all. Yet again, this is driven by the taxpayers in all three districts. So the boards have to approve on what we're going to do. Once the boards approve it, then we're going to move into a ballot measure. And then in November, if the boards approve everything, there will be a ballot measure. And that will be the final approval. The final approval for this will be by the residents of, our, of the three districts. So this is where I wanted to get to, and I still have a little bit of time left. The survey. So we did a community survey. We talked about it here several times. I didn't do that. We talked about this several times here, this survey. It went out text message, email, every avenue that we had. We actually hired a professional survey company because while the three of us are very good at certain things, that is not one of them. So we hired Magellan, which is a professional survey company, to craft this survey. It went out there. We had 1,160 people completed the survey, which, as the, the survey company said, that's, that's a great return. We had no idea, because yet again, this is not my purview. 80% approval of fire protection and emergency rescue services. So 80% of our districts across the three said we're doing a decent job. 70% believe that the fire risk in their community has increased. 60% don't believe their district has resources needed, and over 70 support a non-specified property tax increase. Now that's a big one. We didn't know what we were going into, and this is a real big reason we wanted to put this survey out. When asked, there were certain uh, thresholds on there. There was a very high all the way to 16 mils on this survey. We're going to keep reaching out to people to see. None of this hinges upon, you know, some people have called this a thinly billed attempt at raising taxes. Yet again, we're going to be doing all this community outreach over the next few months to figure out what that threshold will be and what kind of services we can provide. Set the, uh, so the tax increase, 74% in Inter Elk Creek, 80 in Inner Canyon, 69 in North Fork. What these results told us is we need, to, we need to pursue this. We need to keep working on this project because obviously the public thinks it's a good idea. That's what's kind of pushed us where we are today. Community engagement, we're going to be sending out a letter to every address across all three districts. We're going to be doing that here probably middle of March. It's going to talk about the project. It's going to talk about what we're doing. It's going to encourage people. We're going to each have open houses in our districts. We're going to try and have two open houses at our firehouse, public forums, ask questions, come, see what we do. 
We're going to have as much as we can all across our social media. We're going to try and have booths at all the community events. What this is to tell people what we're doing and to get the input. Yet again, this is all driven by the residents of the district. And the immediate next steps. Right now, we're finalizing the details of our engagement. Yet again, education is something that's the only way we're going to get the word out to figure out if this is even worth going to the ballot. We're working on our financials for the district. We're also working on a website with a tax calculator. That's a big one. When, when we say mill levy, does, does everybody know what mill levies actually mean? Some people do and some people don't. It depends. One minute. I'm on it. Um, so we're going to have a tax calculator on there where you can actually plug in the value of your home and see how that would affect your dwelling. And then planning our open houses. That's going to be coming out soon, and I encourage you, please, just like you come up to this, come out to our open houses. I think at Elk Creek we're already talking about it, and I think at the rest of them we'll have some sort of barbecue thing as well. Questions. Take a picture of this. Please ask questions. Email us. Um, our doors are always open in our firehouses. If you have any questions at all, concerns, reach out and come talk to whichever district you live in, and or talk to the other ones. Our doors are always open. And that's it, and I think I'm right there, and she, oh, she's not even going to show me the, the time. Oh, we still have time? Oh, all right. Thank you, everybody. And yet again, this is driven by you guys, so please reach out, ask questions, talk and learn about this process. Thank you, guys. Um, excellent presentation. So definitely get the questions answered that you have on that. Um, they will be here to talk to you. They're everybody, all the presenters, all the speakers are still here. They love to talk to you. We also have um, our community ambassadors from Elk Creek and Inner Canyon. And um, so please, if you do not know who your community ambassador is, is kind of kind of the lead person in your planning unit in your area. Please go see who that is. Um, talk to them. They have some excellent brochures that you can use for fire mitigation, um, chipping program, everything. So please go talk to them. We also have Beaver Ranch here tonight. Um, they're actually working on a new master plan, and they have a new playground that they're going to be working on. So go, they've got some very exciting new drawings for that, so please go talk to them. Um, and it's, it's just wonderful to have you out tonight. I'm so, so glad you came in the cold weather and everything. Um, our next town hall meeting, hopefully not as much snow, not as cold, will be April 19th. And we hope to have a really big crowd. We'll be, um, we'll have lots of great information, speakers, um, information you really need to know if you live up here. So thanks for coming. Please stick around. Thanks.